Assalamu alaikum, welcome to Freshly Grounded. Before we get started guys, please remember the two points that I mentioned last episode. Uh, point number one, um, we're so close to 100,000 subscribers, so close. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this, head over to youtube.com forward slash Freshly Grounded. If you're already watching it on YouTube, just click on the subscribe button at the bottom and hit subscribe. And uh, let's hit 100k, we've been doing this for far too long. Uh, we've been on a slow burner. But we're over six years in and we're so close to 100K and uh, we've got some great plans. We've actually, hopefully if all goes well, got some plans to release some nice merch for 100K subscribers and stuff, but it's not done yet. So it might end up like not working out time-wise, but let's see, inshallah. Second thing, uh, it's the month of Ramadan. We are raising money this month as we do every year for the Spot Project. Uh, you can head to givebright.com forward slash FG to help provide food, education, healthcare uh, to orphans uh, in Gambia. And um, you guys would have seen in our previous vlogs uh, that we did in Gambia and stuff that it's a project that's very close to our heart. Uh, this episode is with Anas Abu Alaban. I hope I've pronounced his name right. I've actually never pronounced, said his full name to him. But uh, Anas is... Um, a, uh, has a master's in robotics. Uh, he is also the CEO of Tertil, one of the co-founders of Tertil. Tertil, of course, being uh, a company that I, um, uh, an organization that I joined uh, about seven, eight months ago now. I think it was August 2022. Um, they currently, their, their key product is that it's the world's, it's the world's first AI-powered Quran companion. It's an app that allows you to, uh, it helps you memorize Quran. Uh, how does it do that? It uses AI to help you. You can blank out any page of the Quran and then you can start reciting. As you recite, it fills in the ayat and it can also detect your mistakes. So any words that you miss, say the wrong word, or you miss a word or you say an extra word, it will highlight it in red and it will give you a little buzz sound and um, stores all of your previous mistakes and stuff. It's incredible if you're memorizing the Quran. Or if you just want to start even memorizing the Quran, it also has this like cool feature that's like never spoken about, which is um, the search functionality. And um, essentially, you can just like recite any ayah into the app, and it will find that ayah instantly. Uh, but anyway, I go off on a tangent. Uh, Anas is also a uh, also studied electrical and computer engineering, and um, is just an incredibly interesting individual. Before Tartil, he was a software engineer at AWS, uh, working on the RoboMaker, I believe. Uh, and um, Anas, I think, is very humble with how much he kind of like, how obsessed he is with the world of tech and AI and robotics and, uh, and, and his level of intelligence. I wanted to get him on because there's this huge hype around AI right now. And... Um, and even if you see, there's a bunch of, if you look at like any business podcast right now, they're having the guests um, around AI. We're obviously not a, a, a business podcast. We're just like an everything podcast for Muslims. Uh, but with AI being the hot topic, uh, I thought who better to call on than Anas and uh, speak to him about all that kind of they're doing at Tertil, but mostly just about AI, understanding it, where it's going. Should we be scared? Should we be excited? Uh, what does it mean for us? And uh, it was an incredible conversation. I think you guys will enjoy it. Uh, if it sounds like something like, oh, AI, that's not my kind of thing. I think uh, give this one a shot. Uh, and uh, if anything, you'll learn a thing or two, inshallah, like I did. And uh, yeah, if you want to check out Tertil, head to tertil.ai. If you want to check out Anas, I'll leave his links in the description. With that being said, this is episode 317, I believe, of Freshly Grounded. Freshly Grounded. <laughs> Guys, it's 11.15 p.m. I just said Freshly Grounded. Uh, <laughs> that's the first time I've said Freshly Grounded. Uh, let's stick to that. Here's Freshly Grounded, episode 317. Enjoy. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Anas, how are you doing? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's been, uh, we're already having technical problems talking about a technical podcast. I know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Bismillah. Thank you for joining me, man. I appreciate it. It's your second time here and uh, hopefully this one will be a lot more kind of relaxed because we've uh, we've done one of these before already. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, likewise. I'm excited to talk to you again after I've been talking to you almost every day. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, right okay so here's how i want to begin this episode um i want to paint a picture right so about 15 years ago 
we we will get somewhere here. We, we're gonna go we're gonna go off a bit, and then we'll come all the way back round to the topic of this podcast. So, about fifteen years ago, when I was at high school, which sounds insane to say, uh, there was um, before MMA and UFC. So MMA the sport and UFC the the product were as mainstream as they are now. Back then, they were um, they were free. In fact, the UFC, what, what now are like the pay-per-views, were in the UK at least, they were free. Not only were they free, but they were on a, um, they were on a channel that was like a free, uh, it's like a super low kind of brand channel. It was called Bravo. Bravo, it, by, by no stretch of the margin, is anything classy uh, in the UK. And, um, and only like the, the true hardcore fans who, who really were fans of MMA would, uh, would, would see or watch UFC. Uh, and there was other shows like Cage Warriors and stuff like that. Then what happened is a few years into it um, came the Ronda Rousey era, the Conor McGregor era, the John Jones era. And then all of a sudden, everybody started speaking about MMA and UFC. And what had happened is those guys who had been watching it since the Bravo days just couldn't stand a conversation with people who were like, oh, have you watched the latest UFC? So with that in mind, all that in mind, being somebody who has, who is studied in uh, the realm of robotics, who lives and breathes, whose career is in AI, are you currently in this world right now feeling that, but with, uh, with all of the discussions going on around kind of open AI, chat GPT, and all of the different AI kind of uh, happenings in the world? Is that you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of, you know, bogus going out there. And there's a lot of, like, um, knockoffs and stuff like that. And, like, everyone's trying to, you know, grab a piece of the, you know, the market or, you know, the technology space or whatever it is. So um, everyone's just trying to, like, get on board the hype train. It's, it's, it's uh, the same season as crypto was uh, two years ago. But uh, once everyone started to realize there's a world outside you know there's grass there's sun when the covid lockdowns are lifted everyone just like left crypto and left the metaverse and like oh look now we have ai that they jump on this hype train so yeah yeah you know what i, I didn't want to speak about tortillas so early in the podcast i wanted to kind of save it towards a bit later but it's interesting you say that because my pitch to people kind of when i was first speaking to to, to people about tortilla when i jumped on board and uh, there'll be many questions, is I'll pitch it as these guys behind Tertil, this is not just a white label a product. It's not something that, um, like, uh, you know, back in the day we would, you know, um, sign up to GoDaddy or whoever's affiliate scheme, and you can have like a white label domain website, and you get like a a dollar for every time a domain sells or whatever. Like this is not white label. This is guys who live and breathe this. They are they've worked in this field. They've studied these um, various industries. Obviously, uh, Mohammed with kind of more in the mobile engineering side. You with robotics and and and, and AI. And um, and so this is serious. And this is like if you were to believe in Tertil, yes, believe in it because you enjoy the product. But for me, the sell really is the people behind it because that's what gives anything true value uh, knowing that the people behind it are not kind of a fad or um, you know trying to jump on the next hype like you said trying to see where the money is at where the trend is at where fame would be at and uh, and so when you say now everybody's kind of like interested and, and jumping on board with it uh, it that's kind of always been my sell because my sell with Tertil has been the guys behind Tertil are anti that and actually are the real deal and I think nowadays there's a lot happening with AI or we're gonna start seeing a lot with AI I think where people are not necessarily the real deal and I've started seeing it myself like on Facebook now I'm getting ads on sorry on as like Instagram ads of like people selling you know um, a GPT kind of um, open source like whatsapp versions and all these different types of versions and courses on how to create uh uh products from 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 from, from the uh from the api of gpt and all of that kind of stuff so yeah it's all kind of happening but i think um yeah i i can understand and resonate with what you're saying with regards to kind of there being a lot of mess and fakeness around it i mean it's not necessarily um fake per se um people are actually pretty smart in terms of like how you can make money 
So everyone tries to capitalize on different opportunities. The problem is all the uh, low hanging fruit that's very easy to capitalize on. Like, hey, I'm going to sell you 20 amazing GPT prompts, or I'm going to sell you, you know, this course on like how to build your own like open AI plugin or something like that. Um, it's very easy to uh, reap those low hanging fruits of like crypto, AI, whatever it is, like whatever hype cycles goes on. Um, the hard part is like, how do you actually build something that is uh, delivering value to, you know, customers, to users, to a community, whatever that may be. That's not as easy as, you know, just building, like you said, like, you know, white labeling products or stuff like that. Um, like people just basically take like, you know, whatever someone else has made and then, you know, repurpose it a bit and try and trying to put their own like spin to it. But um really the value where all this stuff can shine is where people actually take the time to think in more depth about how can I use um, this technology to accelerate, you know, or to provide value to certain people. And uh, this is kind of like a guiding principle that someone should have. If someone wants to make a quick buck, by all means, tala, it's fine. You're not scamming anyone, but like, you know, it's something that's very easy that anyone can replicate and, you know, easily puts you out of business. But then like, how do you actually build like, technical mode, something that's value, something that's, you know, useful to, you know, the wider ecosystem. That's harder. And, you know, that's not something that happens like, you know, over the course of a week or a day, like that stuff usually takes like months and sometimes years in order to achieve like open AI has been working. Like they initially started out in the robotics field and, you know, it took them years until they reached a state where like, wow, they have these like large language models that can actually like have some semblance of intelligence. Uh, and you know, provide some value to people. How how common is that transition of like studying robotics and going into AI? Because it seems like that was your journey as well. How how closely are they linked? And is that generally the trend that people tend to go down? What do you study kind of in in a in a brief way when you when you're studying robotics? That is. You know, that's a very interesting observation. I never realized, like, I followed the similar path to, like, open AI. They went from, like, robotics to AI, and then I also went from robotics to AI. Maybe they're the ones who are copying me. But, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, what's nice is, like... You never got the credit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with robotics, a lot of the mathematical fundamentals, like linear algebra, a little bit of statistics here and there, um, is very similar to uh, what is used, um, you know, in machine learning and AI. So in robotics, for example, we learn about um, 3D transformations and, and matrices and all this stuff. And uh, that all, you know, the underlying principles behind that is linear algebra and, you know, sometimes a mix of like probability and statistics here and there. Um, and we do it in a more complicated fashion because like you're working with like six degrees of freedom with robot arms and, you know, you're trying to like get like small like hands to like grasp certain objects and you're trying to figure out where do I grasp something? How do I grasp it? What's like the right force? All that stuff. How do I move my arm? How do I make sure like it doesn't flail around and like smack someone's head off and, you know, um, probably injure someone. Um, I like to joke around like, you know, I like to talk with robots and, you know, when I play around, like you just like make robots like hands flail around. So a lot of the underlying like mathematics and principles is very similar. So I believe when OpenAI wanted to make that transition over into like, you know, just pure machine learning essentially um the the mathematical fundamentals were the same and a lot of like you know the software that was used is very similar um so people can make that transition um it's it's, it's simple it's not necessarily easy like there's still some stuff to learn but that transition is a bit more straightforward compared to for example someone coming from like a physics background or someone coming from um i don't know a um uh, mechanical engineering uh, background. Um, there's some things like you'd have to learn. There's like some basics, but like at the end of the day, it's all the same. Um, and that's usually like the first step that helps you like understand the theory, the fundamentals, and all that stuff. But then there's like a second layer is like, okay, how do you upskill yourself? How do you specialize yourself in like this field? And that usually takes a bit more time. But that it, you know, the 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 relationship, you know, of like the the fundamentals and the theory is what makes it kind of like easy quote unquote, to transfer like, you know, from robotics to uh, like just applied AI or applied machine learning. Is, is, is studying engineering a part of robotics? Um, 
I mean, yeah, it's an engineering discipline. Like that's the whole thing, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. So like, but, as in, but you're there's, writing there's the like, code. Well, yeah. For the robot to do its thing. Yeah. But there's multiple like sub disciplines. Like you can be in the mechanical discipline where like you're actually building like, you know, the joints and the links and the appendices and all that Fine. stuff. Um, or you can be in the electrical engineering discipline. So like you're doing all the wiring to make sure like, you know, the robot moves properly, or you could be in the software engineering discipline, which is usually more around like, you know, uh, the algorithms and the, you know, the behaviors of the robot, making sure it's actually like, you know, um, behaving properly. Like when you see, um, for example, like Boston dynamics and their, uh, Atlas robot, that's like an amalgamation of like a bunch of engineering disciplines. Uh, what's very interesting is like, they don't actually use a lot of, um, AI quote unquote, most of that is in the field of, uh, it's called control theory. Um, so it's a mix of like mechanical and electrical engineering and like, uh, it's, it's, a like a mathematically, um, you know, provable, uh, like, you know, equation that this, uh, this robot follows in order to make sure like it stays balanced and upright and stuff like that. And so a lot of this stuff, like all these behaviors are mostly hard coded like in terms of like how it walks, how it runs and all that stuff. So that's not necessarily AI. What AI would add to those kinds of robots is basically having an understanding of like, I need to get from point A to point B. What's the path that I can take to get there, for example, or I need to pick up, you know, uh, like someone told me I need to go pick up, you know, the coffee from the kitchen and bring it over to me in the living room. You know, how do you, how does, how does the robot understand how to do that? That's what AI will help you to do. But usually like the the mechanical engineering, the electrical engineering side of things is like, okay, I need to like, you know, move my hand in a certain position and, you know, actually grab, make sure like I don't lean too much. So I like, I fall back or like, you know, I mess up. Um, so that, that's basically how it is. Just try it. Hopefully that's, that's simple as, as I can. Hopefully no, no, that's a good, that's head. actually a good transition. No, it, it, that explanation of the 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 thinking behind ai or the differentiation the differentiation between ai and other disciplines is uh is a helpful transition uh to to speak about uh ai in itself and to backtrack a bit before we start digging into kind of i want to talk a bit about your use case and um uh it, with, with with the various plugins prompts that you're using and stuff like that as well but before we do any of that um how would you explain ai as an umbrella term, and then more specifically, why people are excited right now because of kind of GPT and open AI. Uh, how would you explain that to some a, a kind of a non-technical person uh, like myself? So artificial intelligence is basically like the, the study of, you know, basically providing um, intelligence to, you know, non-sentient entities like, you know, computers and stuff like that. That's the way I like to think about it. And AI has been a field that's studied since like the 90s. Um, it's been, you know, widely researched and, you know, widely, you know, explored, um, especially back back in like in the early 1900s or the late 1900s, sorry, um, where, you know, a bunch of researchers implemented like different neural networks to like recognize digits and that sort of stuff. And what was interesting is uh, the research and the math was there, but the hardware and the software wasn't. And so people couldn't actually implement, you know, AI applications because it just wasn't feasible. It was only reasonable in like a research discipline. Um, it wasn't until, you know, like the late 2000s when companies like NVIDIA and AMD started to build a graphical processing units, GPUs, to be able to perform the computations necessary for, um, uh, AI to be deployed on a wider scale, not just, you know, in um, research applications. So you don't need to buy like a hundred thousand dollar GPU. You could buy a thousand dollars, throw it in like, you know, your business or something like that. And then now it's, you know, also consumer grade. So we have consumer grade applications uh, for AI. So AI was a big thing back then. And, you know, it, it was, it was able to recognize digits and stuff like that, but people just didn't make advancements because the hardware and software wasn't there. So we had, what's called like an AI winter. And then fast forward now, um, you know, we now have the hardware and the software that is that allows us to build AI applications, not only like on, you know, commercial hardware, 
but like on your iPhone or on your, your, you know, your MacBook, basically your web browser, uh, that that's how far the field has come. And people use it as a wide umbrella term to, um, as basically anything that has some form of like, um, intelligence that's able to like make decisions on its own, which is a bit, you know, broad, but you know, that's, that's the mainstream thinking behind it. But for those who are more specialized, like it, it's explicitly, you know, um, the uh, research and the application of uh, neural networks and, you know, probabilistic methods to, um, you know, to develop, you know, these sort of like algorithms and models uh, that can like predict certain behaviors or like, you know, infer uh, certain um, basically situations and make decisions on their own based on things that they've learned in the past. Um or like based on things that they've learned from like certain you know data sets and stuff like that. Uh, so that's like a quick overview. I'll pause here just so I don't also go off on a tangent and start become like a rambling professor. No, that's good. That's good. It's helpful. Okay, and then let's talk about the excitement right now, which is uh, kind of has seems to have kind of peaked with GPT four. So you know who what is you don't have to i suppose like give us a background history on like the 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 business of open ai but essentially why are people so excited about you know chat gpt and and potentially the future of where chat gpt could uh could take us could lead in terms of you know it's uh how it could be int integrated into into other products and uh, yeah what it means for like society yeah. at mass yeah. So a few years ago, some researchers out of Google uh, came up with a paper. Um, it's called uh, Attention is All You Need. And they developed a new, uh, basically, machine learning uh, component or building blocks. So usually the way you build machine learning models is like you have different, like, you know, blocks and components you put together to kind of like build a, um, build a model, um, build like, the, you know, the, the AI model. And people have been using, you know, different um, blocks from before. It was called like convolutional neural networks, um, RNN, CNNs, all the stuff. I won't go too much in the te into the technical detail, but these researchers basically implemented a new kind of uh, machine learning building block. And that sparked a uh, much more powerful, uh, you know, version of uh, machine learning models that was capable of performing, you know, uh, essentially like tasks for that were before, like that weren't as accurate. It allowed them to perform it much better. Uh, in this case specifically, uh, it allowed people to like, you know, recognize, for example, like images, voice, and even, you know, generate text uh, much more accurately in a way that more closely resembles human behavior. And so uh, when, you know, though the people who, who created that, um, who developed that, you know, that initial like uh, transformer model that, that wrote that initial paper, they all went out to basically, you know, run their own companies, Cohere, OpenAI and all that stuff. And they're starting to build basically uh, a business uh, around uh, this new type of model. And you, it took them a few years in order to take something from research into production. So the journey of chat GPT wasn't something that happened over the course of the last few months. It was like, you know, something that was over the course of the last few years. And now what we're seeing is finally, you know, the fruits of, you know, their, their labor where we've not only been able to uh, build uh, a model that is capable of, you know, generating text that is relatively intelligent. It still makes mistakes, but you know, it's still, um, you know, almost on par with a uh, certain level of human intelligence. And at the same time, deployed in a manner that can be consumed by, you know, the masses. So from before this stuff was sort of limited to kind of like running in like Google or Amazon's like data centers and stuff like that. It still is. But like now, you know, I can, you know, download basically one of these models and like run it on a $600, $700 like GPU or like a thousand dollar GPU if I have the budget for it. Uh, so that, that basically is kind of like, you know, what we're seeing now is the culmination of work over the last few years. And because the progress has increased um, exponentially, especially with the recent trend in like making models open source, now you have not only big companies like Facebook and Google working on this technology, it's basically the whole world is now able yeah. to develop this in, in an open source fashion. And basically that's like accelerated like the pace of, uh, you know, innovation in, in this space. 
I heard that the current version, GPT-4, is something that had been complete. The build of it had completed last summer. Uh, I don't know how true that is. But what does that mean? Because to me, that sounds like... Um, that sounds super outdated in the world of technology that, 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 that it's taken that long for something like this to come up. But obviously this is a new technology and I suppose that time frame will get shorter and shorter. But what does it mean that kind of build was completed then? And, and, uh, and I think I heard something like it was a, it's, it's, it's from a snapshot from 2021. These are all things I'm kind of hearing here, there and everywhere. But um, yeah, what, what does that kind of stuff mean? So and so how long would we have to wait for like... Okay. Oh, for example, another version. I mean, I know you're not from OpenAI, so I appreciate that I'm kind of making it sound like an interview with someone who is, but uh, yeah, just trying to pick no, your brain no. on that. It's fine. Um, so the data that um, OpenAI collected um, to train the model is basically data that's usually from like 2021, 2022. And first of all, collecting that data takes time, parsing through it, making sure it's clean. Um, OpenAI probably went through like a lot of... Um, manual like labeling and annotations apparently they have like a team of like you know in-house um annotators who review data who you know make sure it's like clean and this is also by the way why their model performs much better compared to like open source models out there because at the end of the day um data is king your models is going to learn from what's in your data set and if it has bias if it has you know um nsfw stuff if it has things like you know that are violent or inflammatory your model is going to learn you know those certain patterns and behavior so um, the reason their model performs better is because they took the time to clean up basically their data set of uh, a text that they used to train the model. So they took the time to label and clean all this text, and then they used that data to train a model. Uh, the problem is training a model is very slow and very expensive. And this is why OpenAI needs like millions of dollars and why they wanted to sign a contract with Microsoft because... Um, Microsoft has a bunch of GPUs, has a bunch of data centers, and makes it easy for a startup. A bunch of like, money. A bunch of money. And then makes it easy for a startup like OpenAI to train these models. So they have an unfair advantage in the space. Um, like one of the models, like um, Facebook recently posted, like it was trained on like some thousand um, GPUs, basically. I don't have money for a thousand GPUs. So, you know, no startup has that amount of money. Um, and yeah. you need you need that amount of compute to actually train the model. And it also takes time. So by the time they have the technology to scale training to thousands of GPUs and collect the data and train the model, you know, all this stuff takes time, takes, you know, effort. And training like a model on one GPU is not the same as training a model on a thousand GPUs. There was a lot of technical innovation that had to happen um, in order for, uh, training such a large model on so many GPUs, um, to, you know, in order to make it feasible. Um, technologies uh, that you might not hear of, which you might other AI researchers would hear of, like, you know, deep speed, uh, gradient checkpointing, all this sort of stuff. Like, these are innovations that came up in the field because people were struggling to train these huge models. And so when these innovations, you know, started to come out and, you know, people were able to train the models and usually it doesn't take, like, you know, a a few days that you sometimes can take a week or like months to, to train a model. And then let's say you figure out there's a problem. Well, there goes a few months of training. You need to go restart uh, all over again. Um, there's, there's also like, you know, more like people are researching ways to minimize, you know, the inefficiency, but basically this is why it takes so long for like a model to, you know, to come out basically. And why they say like, you know, we have a snapshot, like we trained this model from back then. And it took us time basically to optimize it so it can actually run fast, so it can actually like, you know, be used by end consumers and, you know, be hosted on like, you know, a global scale. So how are we training models at Tertil? Because it doesn't feel that slow. And I know it's not the, a huge team. And I know we don't have a thousand GPUs. So how, how, how does that translate to a kind of a startup like what we're doing? So you're very lucky. You came in the, the golden days <laughs> from before. <laughs> I had I had um, I had one one computer sitting in my basement, and that was shared okay. with like two other people. And it was like one janky GPU. It was a very. I, I need to find a picture for you. I'm pretty sure I'll, yeah, I'll send please. you the picture, and you can put it after. You'll see like yeah, the yeah, first yeah. GPU server I built. It was like some janky, like you know construction <laughs> um and we use that to train like models and it took 
I remember like even for like a smaller model, it would take like a week or something for us to train, um, you know, stuff on our data set. And we weren't using like a thousand, like thousands of hours. We were training on like 50, 100 hours uh, of data and it would take us like a week. Um, and so things are pretty slow. Wow. So I upgraded that GPU. Now we have another one sitting in the basement um, and then one on my computer just for quick rapid testing. And now like we brought down that time to like, you know, a few days. And then uh, Alhamdulillah, we've had a uh, beneficial uh, donor. Um, hopefully we'll be able to publicize it soon. Um, but we've had, you know, a uh, beneficiary basically grants us access to uh, HPC, a high performance computing cluster. Uh, in order to train these models, so this their their cluster has like a few hundred like GPUs, and that has helped us like significantly accelerate um, the rate at which we we train our models. So instead of taking you know weeks to days, and now it's like you know like one maybe two days, maybe even half a day sometimes, like six to twenty four hours, and that time period is getting smaller and smaller. So with regards to training models, I know you 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 went over uh, over kind of I suppose an overview of kind of the model training. Uh, I suppose what I'll say is, w w the way I used to explain AI when, uh, you know, uh, w with my bro science, when you're sitting in a room full of people and you kind of, early, in the early days, like a couple years ago, you started hearing the term AI. I, the, the impression I got of AI was, if I was to explain it in a sentence, was that it's um, intelli artificial intelligence that uh, that learns as you use it. So the more data you give it, the more you feed it, the more it understands and then kind of can adapt. And over time, I've realized it's a lot more complicated than that. But is that true for all? Uh, is, that, is that true for like the umbrella category of AI or is that not true at all? And then, because it, it, if that were solely true by itself, essentially it wouldn't, nothing would need training because it's just learning and picking up more knowledge as it's being used, right? But um, the fact that models need training kind of is sh showcasing that that's not necessarily just like, it's not as easy as that. Yeah, exactly. No, um, that that is one kind of um, AI like technique. It's called active learning where the model, you know, okay. as, as you know, the model's being used, for example, let's say you have like your users tell you like, hey, I don't like this, you know, post or I don't like this um, or, you know, our, our AI made a mistake, for example, in Tertia, like the users have the option of like marking that as a mistake. Um, you can use that feedback as basically a way of improving the performance of uh, your AI model. Uh, so that's a technique used to improve the model, but it still needs to train and, and whatnot. And people are trying to figure out ways to make this, you know, kind of like a continuous process as opposed to like something that's like discrete. It's something that's kind of like more uh just automatic uh, over time so that that is one way of describing certain types of ai and ai techniques but in general um people the way they refer to it right now is essentially um models that are able to uh infer or predict you know certain things based on like their past you know experiences essentially so we give like an, a, a model audio and it says, hey, like, you know, I've heard something similar to this before. This is what I think this is saying. And then you tell something, like you give like chat GPT a prompt. It's like, hey, you know, I, I understand what this text is saying. And this is like what I should, what I should say to continue following up on this text. And then, you know, the same thing of like images, like, hey, I've seen like, I've seen this dog before. It's like, this is a nice cat. It's like, you know, I've seen like 10 billion cats of this on the internet. So I know mm -hmm. that's a cat. So. Uh I love how your nature is just so polite. Like it's like that. That's one way of explaining a particular type of way you can learn with AI. But no, <laughs> as a, you're very polite at us. Um, okay, let's talk about um, let's talk about like how people are perceiving um, how people are perceiving it before we go into your kind of uh, use case and thirteen and stuff. So um, there's obviously a lot of fear and excitement. Where are you on that scale of fear and excitement? Is there any fear or is it just pure excitement? Um, we're treading lightly. You have to be cautious. Um, so, mashallah, like there's a lot of innovation, technical innovation in the space. And us engineers, um, I think there's like an old saying. It's like, uh, 
we always uh we always try you know we we always like build something but we never ask like if like we always say like could we build this but then, then the question is like should we build this um so there's always a right. question of like you know could and should um and we also like joke around like oh this should work so like, old Mohammed also tells me like this should work <laughs> every time <laughs> like we tell you about a certain feature um so us engineers have that tendency to like you know keep things you know a bit hazy but in general for ai um i think we're close to an inflection point um in terms of like how ai should be like deployed and, and governed or you know verified essentially in terms of its reliability and authenticity and you know its its provenance so i think we should be very skeptical of like a lot of like the ai products the ai technology um whatever someone tells you about ai in general uh, even myself likely what's going to happen is like in a week something's going to change in the field and like this whole podcast is going to be outdated um so yeah. you know the the field is just moving so fast and it's important to have like a sense of skepticism uh, in terms of like what's being put out there and you know the information especially that you consume and stuff like that um but it's also good because there's a lot of technical advancement that can actually uh you know improve you know human's quality of life in general like there's this ai that's able to like you know uh generate different like protein folds and like you know uh, have different applications in the field of biology in terms of like identifying different like you know um proteins and chemicals you know for like different biological you know um applications and you know processes and then the same thing for like you know copywriting and stuff like that like people that, for now it's very easy for us to like quickly create content you know quickly organize like people together and stuff like that so there's a lot of value being added to the ecosystem but there's also needs to be like a healthy amount of skepticism and recently you know there's been like this call to action where you know a bunch of folks like Elon and Ahmad from Stability AI are calling for people to you know have like a healthy sense of skepticism like wait let's like let's hold off from like releasing more language models because you know there's bad actors out there there's things that you know people might misuse like this ai for um like deep fakes and all the stuff like that we're already seeing get out in the wild so um there's there should be like a nice balance between like skepticism and optimism and people are trying to push for uh not necessarily like regulation and minimizing like you know the the full potential of ai but just making sure that what we put out there is you know verifiable you know authentic and value actually valuable instead of just like adding more noise to uh the whole you know ecosystem in general one good example i want to give is um there's a group of amazing muslims mashallah working in the generative ai space for um exploring like the islamic sciences and you know building things like hadith gpt hadith.ai and you know mufti menk or menk.ai and stuff like that like you know they parse all his videos and you know they put it they put it and they feed it into like gpt to like fine tune and that's a lot uh, of data yeah it's a lot of data and it's good you know it's very <laughs> beneficial like instead of me having to sift through like hundreds of videos or like you know thousands of books to figure out the knowledge you know that i want i can just you know uh query and extract that information you know using artificial intelligence or using like a language model the problem is like the this can ai you see how that sounds scary to like um there's so much of islam is there's so much honor in the idea of islam being a classical the methodology of studying islam being so classical and kind of the tradition of um studying books and 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 striving for information and or, and obviously like i suppose from from a standpoint from a scholarly standpoint also like or, or from like a from a standpoint that like knowledge is to be strived for and stuff like that i think do, is there an, is there, there 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 seems to be something scary about ai and islam and that that's something that has to be tread even more carefully right and um i suppose we can talk about that when we talk about tertil but i just wanted to bring up as you kind of mentioned it there's like an exciting element of it where there's definitely an element that sounds scary yeah but like from the islamic perspective even more so i guess yeah because here's what's here's what'll happen is like these language models like you'll you'll fine tune them on like certain amounts of data whether it's like mufti menk or whatever and 
they they what they call it they do what's called like hallucination or they even like you know just output wrong information and there's no way to you know uh verify that the information that these language models output is is valid or true and i mean the same thing could be said for our ai like sometimes like it it does make certain mistakes especially like one common mistake we found is like the med it's very difficult for the ai to recognize like the long med um so there's the, the technology is there but it's not in a manner that befits the uh you know the application to islam and you know the islamic sciences and it is useful in the sense of extracting information and being able to identify where information came from yes and that that should be yeah. the main use case right now but a lot of people should tread very carefully and very lightly when it comes to releasing these sorts of applications uh that basically just give you like a you know one shot answer is like sometimes you might ask one of these um like i think someone tried to ask one of these like hadith gpt or i don't know it's like you know can i consume pork you know why is jesus the final prophet salam or like you know um how many gods can i believe in and these are all like heretical things like you know in, in islam and uh you you ask the ai this and tell you oh you can do x y and z or you know you can eat pork because of this um but you know you have to be very careful like you know the ai doesn't actually give you that because that's false information about islam um but the ai will do that because you know it's just programmed to spit out information right but what what it is useful in is in querying and extracting information uh, using like semantic search and and stuff like that and that that should be like the main use case right now but you know sure. people need to be very careful simply about the the application of it no i agree i think uh, the fact that it, uh, a technology like this exists is great and there has to be it has to be used with uh, maturity and uh, like anything because um you could use a knife in the wrong way but all of us have knives in our houses and so uh i i i do agree and and speaking of tortilla actually one one conversation that gave me a lot of kind of um that gave me a lot of reassurance and was again kind of speaking about the importance of the people behind a particular project um I think there was a lot of the, uh, kind of the most requested feature on Tertil, I think, is uh, our outside with the coloured mushaf is um, is a Tajweed correction, right? And um, and it's really interesting because nobody's ever um, nobody ever shies away from a conversation in the organisation, which is lovely. It feels very open, and um, I remember we brought this concern up with Mohammed at the time we were on a call, and Mohammed said something that was just it felt very reassuring and it felt like here are people who are doing this with that level of maturity that you would want somebody dealing with such an intricate thing uh, to have. And um, I was with one of the teachers and we were kind of introducing Tartil and going through it and he, he loved it as, as most, uh, like everybody we've shown Tartil to does. And then the skepticism on, it, on, on their part was like, well, we want to be able to have Tajweed correction uh, because that's kind of eventually going to be the next step. But then like, how do you do that? Um, uh, considering the fact that Tajweed correction is such an intricate thing, right? And um, and it's not necessarily it's not not necessarily going to be the case that a computer can correct Tajweed all the time or in the correct manner. And Mohammed's answer was great. He said, "Look, there's going to be a certain there's going to be certain Tajweed rules that we're just never going to have in our in our app." And um, and I think that was great. That honesty was great. And that honesty was very reassuring because um, it's an honest conversation. And and, it, and it's not coming from the perspective of somebody who's like, we're going to create the best product regardless of uh, regardless of anything. We just want to like create the biggest product in the world. It was coming from someone who, who was a Muslim first and said, look, we, inevitably, we're not going to be able to create all, the, all of the Tajweed rules within, within the Quran. When we do, they're going to be kind of ones that we can... Um, in, uh, have that can interact with the app and so whether that's like figuring out the mud issue like making sure that we, we can like it doesn't fail when you when when somebody extends their mud or or whatever it may be uh and i think those conversations are always fun to have and it's good to kind of have those open conversations with people like mohammed like yourselves on those kind of topics um right let me let, let, let's dig into you then so uh and and your use case for for um uh, GPT specifically. So, 
I I had a conversation with you. We were, we were on a call uh, a couple months back. Uh, I think you were just showing me. I think you were just showing me something that like how something works on our system or something like that. And I saw in your um, I saw in your bookmarks uh, your bookmarks toolbar. I think that you had ChatGPT there. And I said to you, and this was early. This was like very early in the hype a few months ago. And I said, do you use ChatGPT that regular ChatGPT that regularly? And you're like, yeah, I use it all the time. And I was like, well, what do you use it for? And you're like, you know, answering emails and uh, copy and like anything that I can just quickly get done, ideas. And um, I kid you not, since that day, I've had ChatGPT in my toolbar. Uh, you inspired me. And, and like, you know, I've been using it for marketing strategies, for like, you know, when you get kind of a, a mental block, you're trying to think, well, what's the best way of doing kind of a social media kind of launch here and stuff like that. Very, very helpful. And um, and so I thank you for that because you inspired me to do that. But uh, how, what is your, what, what's your use case like with ChatGPT? Are you still using it daily? If you are, uh, what are you using it for? And then secondly, what kind of prompts have you found that work really well for you? Because there's like this huge... Twitter kind of uh, like spike of people speaking about the various prompts. People have even created websites with like prompts to try. I've tried a few of those. Uh, one of my favorites is still just like explaining, explain to me like I am. Someone's actually created like a, a, a plugin or a website where you can select the age like that you want to have something explained to you as, which is great. Um, so yeah, so what kind of prompts are you using? Are you still using it daily? How do you use it? And uh, can you inspire us to uh, become more productive uh, with, with our our time as well? Yeah. Uh, um, I mostly use it just for programming, honestly. It's like that's the main use case. Um, I, I've, I've Googled stuff before, but sometimes it's just easy to just get the exact, like, you know, um, you know, script that you want, copy paste that and modify it to your use case. Um, but a good example, like a good comment that someone gave on chat GPT's capabilities is basically it's like a, it's like a junior developer that needs a lot of like handholding and, and, you know, code review. So you should like, it's given me a lot of like, it's actually given me the wrong thing. Um, 95% of the time, 90% of the time. But like it's wrong in like, you know, one small like, you know, line or like one small behavior because I wasn't explicit or something like that. Um, and so I just like, mod like I, it gives me the general structure of what I want. And then I just like modify it from my use case. Um, so you have to be very explicit and very clear about what you want. Otherwise, you're going to get something like it'll it'll infer like some sort of behavior that you want. Um, aside from like that, that's been my main use case. Um, sometimes like writing, you know, small bits of copy here and there. Um, one use, one interesting use case, though, is my friend, he's in med school and he's like, I, I introduced him to chat GPT and he started trying out. And I remember the first time, like he tried it out, he's looking at his phone and he looks over to me and he's just like nodding his hands like, oh yeah, like, <laughs> I'm getting to med school now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm getting to med school now. So he's like, I need to get access to this. So um, I gave him access and now I see his prompts. Like he starts like asking things about like, you know, um, high level like um you know formats for like lateral knee pain or stuff like that and it's actually it seems like it's actually pretty smart and pretty accurate like he continues like having a discussion with with chat gpt and i'm like hey man this is running this useful it's pretty good wait why can't he just log isn't it why can't he just log in oh i have the pro account as you want the pro account oh really <laughs> what's the chat... difference uh it's like a one uses chat gpt3 and then the pro account uses chat gpt4 um, which is like the newer model. Basically. Ah, so chat.open, chat.openai.com is chat GPT-3 still. It, it's, it, it, you can select the model, um, up at the top and then you can specify which model you oh. want to use by default. I and think then it's the, like but four is, yeah, four is the latest one. How, how much does four cost? $20 a month. Hey man, we gave you a rush of, uh, Hang him a doodle, so you can like, <laughs> go go buy it for free. By all means, we'll subsidize it. I think at this point it's gonna be like subsidized for all. Dude, I thought I, was, I, th I thought I was using I thought I was using GPT four this whole time on the free version. I thought they just like automatically upgrade you. Yeah, I'm for sure gonna upgrade that. <laughs> My marketing, my marketing, like plat uh, strategies are going to be like, insane now. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I, want, I wonder why you weren't performing. You know, at your ninety nine percent, are you going to perform at the hundred <laughs> percent? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, because I was trying to access GPT-4 and then I just thought, oh, it just seems like, because I went chat, do I, uh, I just like the, the normal one and um, it was all working normally. So I was like, oh, okay, great. They just like updated it like for everybody. Uh, but okay, that's interesting. Uh, fine. Um, uh, da, 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 where do we want to go from here? Uh, I wanted to ask you about, okay, d d yeah, d d the exciting slash scary conversation. I just want to round that up because the reason I asked that question of are you more scared or um, excited? And to be honest, you surprised me because I thought it was just going to be pure. I, I, I almost thought, what's the point in ans asking this question to, to Anas? Because he's obviously excited about the future of AI. I'm uh, but uh, again, a, ver a very much no, no, a very, very much response in saying that you should be skeptical. Uh, and the reason I asked the question is because I don't know if you've yet managed to watch the uh, Lex Friedman podcast with Sam Altman. Have you listened to any of it? And there's this one uh, part <laughs> in which Sam Altman says something. I, I wrote down the quote word for word because I was like, this is such a scary thing to hear. And he said, do we understand everything about why the model does one thing and not the other thing? Certainly not, not always. And then like he went on and I was like, why are you saying that? And I was like, it sounds insane that somebody can build something and like not fully understand like why the thing behaves in a certain way. And that, you know, they're constantly learning. And so I was like, I have to put this question to Anas, like this is a big deal. Uh, and this is my go-to AI guy, so. Uh, yeah, yeah mean, this, those, this those kind been, of things can be scary. Yeah, this has been a problem since like, almost day zero um, for AIs because the way it works, like without diving too deep into the technical details, like you have this model, it's, it does like a bunch of, you know, mathematical calculations based on like probability and statistics. And, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's like all just a bunch of, they call them weights, like the model weights, which is like a bunch of numbers, like how, you know, multiplies and it activates like different like layers and neurons and, and stuff in order to give you like the final output. And, you you can't really understand like we we sometimes understand zeros and ones but you know you can't really understand the whole like probability distribution of like how everything works people have been trying to explore different ways like okay you know when i input like a cat or a dog image like you know these layers get activated and these layers don't get activated but at the end of the day you don't really fundamentally understand like how the model is generating a decision or predicting like you know a certain output and because like if you change one element in the data set that'll change your whole you know like the models weights and you know its probabilities and its calculations will change completely um might be close but like it'll still it'll still change um so there's what's called like a um, model um explainability like it's an active field of research and you know people have been exploring ways to create explainable models for like images and for like you know on recent ones like credit scores and stuff like that, you know, try to understand like, you know, why do you predict someone's gonna have like a good or bad credit score? Um, so that, that's that been an active field of research, but the problem is like for these huge models like chat GPT and whatnot, like there's no way you can like properly understand what's basically going on inside the brain of the model. I suppose it will only see kind of as time goes on, it's one of those things that you can only uh, kind of to an extent sit back and watch and then, um and uh and and, and deal, kind of approach it like we've kind of mentioned with maturity and and there's this like islamic qaeda that i i just think has saved me so many times and it's um a principle that says um nothing good comes with haste and nothing bad comes from from sabr and so i often now you know i haven't necessarily related it to ai until now but Definitely, when 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 there's spikes and trends in 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 the social world of um, things that are interesting or things that are kind of like becoming popular, I tend to sit back and just get an eye, see what's happening with it. Whereas before, I would be very interested to jump on it straight away. And uh, there's you obviously there's clear benefit in it, especially when the creators behind some of these things are themselves uh, waiting to see how others interact with 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 AI and with their softwares and stuff like that. So um, let, let's move the discussion over to Tartil uh, for kind of the final part of this episode, because I, I, I am obviously very excited about Tartil. Um, I can say this because I'm not a founder. Uh, uh, it would still be biased because I'm still uh, part of the organization. But um, I think the most exciting thing 
about tortilla, above everything else for me, is that I truly believe um, that it's the most disruptive, uh, it's the biggest disruptor in 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 the, uh, in the uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the scene, the industry right now. Uh, and I think by an absolute uh, mile. And I don't say that because I'm trying to um, say that you know, but when people are creating products that can essentially benefit the Muslims, uh, although all competition is healthy, I know that we don't necessarily see this as a thing where it's like we need to be the best and the first. But I think the facts are that it's a massive disruptor and it's doing some great things in the space and it's it, it's allowing us to. It for me, the reason I was so excited about tortillas for the first time, it was it was allowing me to see something where um, I felt like something was being created on par with. Um, with like what you're seeing around the world in non in the non-Muslim world, and that kind of feels right because uh, it, I never really understood uh, in the early days what you guys would mean when you would say we're trying to reignite the Islamic Golden Age. But I understand it now. I understand it now because I understand now that uh, so much of what's used now by the world was, um, uh, you know, thought. Of by Muslims or by by Muslim thought leaders and uh, you know the obvious ones people often talk about is stuff like you know algebra and coffee but um, this feels like that it feels like as big as algebra and coffee right like what Tertil is doing now and so I don't know I suppose my first I, I it's it's kind of like a two part question because I know you you're not going to want to kind of like answer that directly uh, but first of all like do do you feel that uh, does it feel like there's some big change happening here and that like um, it, it feels like we're moving in the right direction. And secondly, probably a question that you'd, you, you'd answer a lot more comfortably is, um, how does Tertil plan to remain uh, up to date or, 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 or to keep moving in such a fast paced industry of, 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 of artificial intelligence or of, of technology in general? Um, my next question will be just to, prepare you uh where does tertil go from there as well because you know are there other products are there other you know oh uh, how far does it want to explore this world of technology so yeah i've asked a bunch of things there. i don't know if you want to like pick apart each individual one or if you want me to kind of like reframe them but i'm just going to kind of throw all of that to you and let you kind of uh, spill yeah so one thing to characterize here or like to highlight here is basically um, our predecessors and the Salaf, I feel like they definitely have, a, like we're, we're standing on the shoulder of giants. I think all of us are um, like from Khawarizmi to, you know, uh, what do you call it? To like uh, Ibn Sina and, and all these people, they, um, they were pioneers in their field, not just for Muslims, but for, uh, wider humanity and so they have a, a much more important uh, presence that we need to like you know respect and recognize uh, compared to us like we shouldn't I, I don't feel it's befitting of us to like glorify what we're doing in terms of like actually being revolutionary it's revolutionary for Muslims um, specifically but um, maybe inshallah like we'll be able to develop technology that's revenue that's valuable and revolutionary for humanity in general um, and this is kind of like the, the general direction we want to go in is like you build technology that's beneficial for humanity and not just necessarily for, for Muslims. So the people who actually develop stuff that's beneficial for all of humanity probably have more, or they definitely do have a much, uh, last, much more lasting impact and, you know, much more, uh, fadl, as we say, uh, as opposed to like, you know, the, the work that we're doing. Um, so that, that's, uh, one important thing to highlight. However, that, that doesn't mean that us as Muslims, we can't build something or stuff that's beneficial. Mashallah, there's amazing Muslims out there um, that are actually building, you know, amazing stuff in the field of AI, um, who we're also standing on the shoulders of the, of the, like of them. Like Dr. Abdurrahman Muhammad, for example, is an Egyptian researcher, has been working in like, the field of speech recognition for so long. And him and his team, like over at Facebook, they've implemented like a few... Uh, unique, you know, voice recognition, speech recognition models. Um, Imad Mustaf, mashallah, is Muslim, CEO of Stability AI, basically, like, you know, 
leading the whole AI open source revolution almost right now. And uh, a few other Muslims in the space who have uh, innovated and who are uh, arguably having a much larger impact than than we are on on all humanity. Um, so I think it's it's important to recognize those people, to recognize you know their contributions, and you know to make sure that you know they're the ones who um, are are highlighted in terms of you know their wider uh, you know implications of their technology. But as for Tertil, the other thing that we're trying to inspire is like there are people out there, and then how do you take the the technology and the unique um, knowledge that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has bestowed upon these people and upon us, and apply it to uh, the Islamic ecosystem because that's been one component that's just been missing in general, where we're still using papers and pens to highlight you know the mistakes and track you know students' progress in like the in the maqra'as and in the schools or like you know Islamic schools are still like severely like underfunded and you know, the Islamic curriculum is, is usually pretty weak compared to, like, other curriculums. Um, and, like, now they're using, like, technologies and, and stuff like that to, like, make it easier to, like, you know, learn physics, learn math, learn, like, you know, political science and all this stuff. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to take that technology and apply it to the Islamic ecosystem so that Muslims can also benefit uh, from it, essentially. And we're starting basically with, you know, the the source of it all, and that's the, the Qur'an. And the whole purpose, you know, of starting with the Quran is to ensure that it is uh, retained and memorized and, you know, transmitted to the next generation as well and building the tools necessary to do that. Once we have that as like a baseline to start with, like we have the the assess, the foundations, you know, for the Muslims, which is the, the Quran, I feel like then that's when we can kind of like, you know, slowly start to transition into other spaces for uh, Muslims specifically, it's so, like basically we're fo- like if you look at it from you know a pure like startup perspective, like you're focusing on a niche and a very specific niche, and like you know you cater towards that population, and then you slowly start to expand your target market and you know your products and your services in order to serve a wider you know um, wider market or wider audience, uh, and that's that's the way that I've been thinking about it. Is like, Alhamdulillah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has granted us the ability to build the technology and to serve, you know, the Muslims with it. Um, it still needs work. It still needs a bit more polish. But at the same time, what we can start working on is like, how do we allow more people to uh, learn how to recite the Quran? You know, things like Qaida Nuraniya, things like, you know, being able to read and, and learn Arabic and which could eventually like evolve into like other applications which are more beneficial to humanity, which is language learning, for example. Like there's a lot of like, you know, apps out there like Duolingo or Zeta Stone and stuff like that. Um, I still feel they're lacking and potentially like some of the work that we've done could be used for like language learning applications in general. And then uh, exp- uh, like expanding from the Quran is like you have the, the hadith and the sunnah is like how do we start to extract information, um, you know, contextualize it and make it accessible for uh, the the masses basically. Like I remember I was attending a um, the Masikna convention and in the the the, uh, the knowledge retreat was focused on the hadith and the seerah and one of the main like core focus during that retreat was basically you know like 90 percent 99 percent of the time like people take the hadith and the quran out of context and you know they read the primary text and they assume like this is you know the the truth but they really they forget like What's going on is like you're taking snippets, you're taking like small pieces of the process of someone's life and you're reading like the, the primary source and you don't have any context about like, you know, what happened during the hadith. Same thing with like, you know, the Quran, you need to understand why the verse was revealed, where it was revealed, you know, what was it revealed for and all that stuff. The same thing needs to be done for the hadith. And so taking that, you can use AI to basically uh, extract information, realize like, you know, what co- like piece information from like different books together you know, and contextualize different, you know, hadith and, and um, you know, verses. And that sort of uh, technology is very valuable, especially for, like, new Muslims or Muslims, like, you know, who, are, who have a lot of questions, who have a lot of, um, you know, doubts. It makes it, uh, it makes the, the, the religion accessible for them because instead of them having to find a scholar, instead of them having to, like, read through tens of thousands of books, like, 
you need to pick up the hadith book and then you need to find the sharh of the hadith you need to find the tafsir and you need to find all this stuff and then you read like three different books and then you're like oh i remember this author said this you know from this period and like i can piece together you know these different kinds of information in order to generate a holistic picture of like what happened during this specific event for this specific hadith whereas ai can like has access to all this information and then it just pieces together it's like yeah i, I remember like you know i caught this reference from this book and you know I was able to put these pieces together and this is like the information I was able to extract. Um, and this has wider implications, not just specific to like the Hadith and Sunnah, but like for research and, and stuff like that. Um, and then comes the, you know, the, the general like uh, faith and, and practice, whether it's like Siyam and, and stuff like that, making sure like, <clears throat> like you build better habits and stuff like that. Having an AI that learns from like your, your habits. Like if you connect to like your Apple health, you can be like, Hey, you know, make sure like, you know, you find you're free during this time. You can pray. Like, this is an optimal, like optimizing your, your, your faith. Like this is the optimal time for you to pray. This is the optimal time for you to sleep, to wake up for Fajr. Like we have a very secular mindset. Like right now is like, Oh, you know, you need to sleep like three or six hours or stuff like that. But like, no, you know, let's find the optimal time for Qiyam. Let's find the optimal time to sleep for Fajr. Um, and so these kinds of like the stuff, like this stuff out there that already exists, but like taking it and applying it to the Islamic, you know, ecosystem is something that's, uh, that's probably like like the next step, and these are, these are all like product ideas. But in general, like the whole purpose is to um, ignite basically people's like you know passion for building for the Muslim Ummah, and through that potentially come up with novel technology that can be beneficial, you know, for you know humanity as as a whole. Inshallah. Oh man, it's exciting, you know, it gets, uh, when you start talking about kind of these different variations and, and, and ideas, uh, ideating is always a, a very fun and um, dangerous uh, rabbit hole because you can go on forever, but uh, yeah, it's definitely exciting and um, it's been so like uh, fun and a pleasure to kind of work on uh, and, you know, within uh, a, a project um, like Tertil or specifically Tertil, uh, and um, it's very exciting to kind of see where, kind of where the future goes uh, with it. I was really excited and keen to have you on. I think um, in general, there's been a lot of time for this uh, AI hype to, to kind of mellow out, and so I thought now would be a good time, and I thought who better than Anas uh, to kind of speak to me uh, with me uh, about it. Uh, it's, it's like you said, kind of like with the crypto thing, you know, you just want to keep, uh, see what's happening. But you, um, I think it was uh, Darmesh, the CTO of, uh, of HubSpot, who said that, you know, this is probably the biggest shift or AI is going to be the biggest shift or biggest change in, in, um, in the, kind of like the technical world. I can't remember the words he used. Um, since the internet and I think people have said that about crypto and people have said that about mobile but this time it feels like it's true and um, and uh, so that was exciting I don't know if you heard that he bought um, he bought uh, the domain chat.com for uh, eight figures so uh, somewhere around 10 million dollars and he doesn't know what he's going to do with it yet. And if you go to it, just go to his LinkedIn page um, and it, a LinkedIn post that says um, that says uh, why he bought it and why he believes that um, it's going to be valuable because of obviously chat-based AI and stuff like that. So uh, he's very excited about it. But it's very interesting. Listen, somebody like that's kind of take on things, obviously, with HubSpot and uh, being a, a multi-billion dollar um, company now and and, and saying that they always kind of forward thinking with those kind of things, especially being such a complicated company. So, yeah, I thought let's have our own kind of uh, uh, Darmesh on. Um, uh, but, uh, 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 yeah, incredible to have you on, bro. Always, always lovely to hear from you. And uh, obviously, as you said, we speak every day, but it's lovely to kind of have a conversation outside of work about kind of what's going on in the world and, and share that with the world as well. So thank you for your time. Oh, yeah, of course. And, you know, I think there's still a lot to, like, you know, distill in terms of, like, AI and whatnot. But I guess, like, for your audience, at least, you know, take, you know, AI is going to be valuable, you know, leverage it for a use case, have a bit of skepticism. And, you know, I do think it, it is like, you know, a uh, like I mentioned before, there is going to be an inflection point. Um, eventually, I, I think what's going to happen is, like, you're going to have, 
like it's it's good to actually about chat.com I didn't hear about that but you're going to have you're not going to have one ai that you're going to What do you think about that? I mean there is people do a lot of marketing tech. They're a marketing company, man. So they let them let them do their marketing. <laughs> but in, yeah, but in general, ten like, million is just easy. <laughs> may Allah, you know, grant us wealth and you know better wealth in Jannah. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I mean. Uh, but uh, I, I think um, there's you're not going to be interacting with one AI. You're going to be interacting with multiple AIs. You're going to have one. You're going to have your Siri. You're going to have your ChatGPT. You're going to have your your Llama or whatever it is. Um, there's going to be a lot of like different AIs are going to be engaged with and each one is going to be specialized. And the ideal uh, situation we want to move forward to is like you have your basically this personal assistant that's geared towards, you know, your use cases, ideally not controlled by like some, you know, evil entity, AKA Amazon, Google or whatever. And, um, you know, use that to, um, improve yourself as, as a human, whether it's like physical, mental, you know, an ideally spiritual well-being, um, like a lot of the secular, like techno, like techno bros, like all they do, they think about, you know, the physical, the mental and, you know, the, the professional style. But ideally, we are also going to push in the spiritual, st- you know, uh, use case where like, how do we leverage AI to um, enable Muslims and, you know, enable people to be more in touch uh, with Islam, inshallah. Inshallah, may Allah put barakah in it, and uh, and um, most importantly, may he um, may he uh, put us and keep us on the straight path. Exactly. Yeah. Because um, it's yeah, because it's a it's an exciting field, but it's most definitely one, as we've mentioned numerous times in this podcast, one that has to be tread carefully. And uh, and uh, only through Allah's kind of guidance and through His, through His blessing, through His mercy, can we hopefully tread it with that with that uh, in mind. So, uh, thank you, Anas. Uh, we will have some uh, uh, links in the bio in the description for people who want to uh, see your incredible uh, Twitter threads. Uh, <laughs> and uh, if they want to get in touch, uh, they can do so. Uh, I'm I'm assuming on Twitter. Uh, it's probably the best place to find you, right? Sure, but uh, yeah, I like uh, Faisal might have alluded to. There's a lot of like sarcasm and jokes and messing around. <laughs> um, don't don't expect a lot of technical content. Maybe once or twice here or there, but it'll be more puns and jokes and jabbing and at memes these, you know, and memes. <laughs> Yeah, Anas loves a good meme. All right, uh, thank you so much, Anas. I'll let you on your fasting still. Uh, so I'm sure you're going to want to get a qaylula in or a, or, or a bit of reading or whatever. So I'll leave that to you, inshallah. Inshallah. Take care. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum